All righty. Good morning, everybody. I have a clicker. Thank you. So I'm Dries. <laughs> I'm from Belgium. Uh, and I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, Drupal today. Um, so what I wanted to talk about today is winning the hearts and minds. Um, as many of you know, or as many of you are about to find out, Drupal is really built on passion. You know, passion from users, passion from developers, and I would like to see us you know, build even more passion by winning the hearts and minds of people, and I think we can do so, can do so through innovation. Um, so before we start, I wanted to give you a few quick examples of you know, really cool innovations. So here is one, which is the, uh, the fish carrier. Some more. Soundproof underwear. <laughs> Obviously, a really great innovation. We have the uh, beard scarf. The good news is they also have a kid's version. So, <laughs> so you can go as a family. Um, there's the cat duster. Not everybody likes cats. Some people have babies. So there is the, uh, there is the baby duster. There is the noodle cooler. <laughs> And then my favorite is the uh, noodle eater hair uh, guard. Um, but the real question, of course, is um, you know, what kind of products win the hearts and minds of uh, people? And so let's look at a few companies or products which were you know, once perceived as being innovative and today no longer are. And you see some of the examples up on the screen, like, uh, Kodak or, you know, Palm or uh, Nokia and, and some other technologies, right? And then on the flip side, there is, you know, products like this, which we all relate to probably as being, you know, very innovative uh, companies like Apple and Google, uh, Facebook, Twitter, and so forth. So the real question is, what's the difference between these two categories of companies or products? Right? And the answer is, um, not a propeller, you know, powered lazy boy, <laughs> but uh, continuous innovation, right? That's what separates the first or the last companies from the first companies. So let's talk a little bit more about that. So if you look at the typical life cycle of a product, it typically has four phases, the development phase, it has the growth phase, the maturity phase, and, the, and then sort of the a decline phase and you know adoption increases, install base increases over time until you reach the decline phase. Um, so what that means for um, for Drupal, for example, I would say Drupal seven right now is kind of you know has just reached the maturity phase. Um, Drupal seven grew very fast. It grew about 2.5 times as fast as Drupal 6 in terms of adoption. So, <laughs> so the way we measured that, by the way, is we looked at how fast we got to 100,000, uh, you know, installations measured by Dito. And it took, I don't, I don't remember the exact length, but it took Drupal 7 2.5 times less time to get to uh, 100,000 uh, installations. Also, um, Drupal 7, the, the number of Drupal 7 installations has now uh, surpassed the number of Drupal 6 installations. So there's more Drupal 7 sites out there. So, so we could you know, probably put Drupal 6 there. It's actually sort of declining as people migrate or upgrade from 6 to 7. That's what's happening. And then obviously Drupal 5 is you know, on its way out. It's obviously still maintained, but you know, fewer and fewer people are using it. And then, of course, as most of you know, I think we're working on Drupal 8 right now, and it's very much in the development phase. And we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So let's go back to innovation, though. So how do these companies uh, innovate? Right? So they innovate because they sort of extend those product life cycles. In the case of Apple, they do so by launching new products like the iPhone, the iPad, uh, and also the iPod. And so where these other companies failed is that they, they stopped innovating. Um, 
you know, and a great example is, is Kodak. Um, they actually owned the, you know, analog photography market. And they invented, I don't know how many people know this, but they invented digital photography, right? Back in 1975, I think. Uh, but they've never been able to really capitalize on that. They weren't bold enough to change and to disrupt their own analog photography business to you know, reinvent themselves and to innovate. And so they died. So there's a big lesson there and a, and a good reminder for us to, to you know, continue to embrace big changes. And I'll talk about of these big changes uh, in this presentation. All right. So... In terms of um, Drupal, obviously we don't have multiple product lines like a company like Apple does. We only have one product, which is Drupal. So the way we innovate is by making each version of Drupal better than the previous version and adding more cool features to it. So that looks roughly like this. So if that's the way we innovate, um, what does that mean for Drupal? So um, let's have a look at the past and the current, I guess, to, to figure out what we need to do uh, going forward. So I wanted to start here with a little bit of Drupal self-reflection. I wanna talk about Drupal's strengths. I wanna talk a little bit about our weaknesses, which is maybe unusual for people that go to traditional technology conferences, but I do like to talk about our weaknesses so we can learn from them. I would like to talk a little bit about the opportunities that we have, and finally, um, some of the threats. Um, but before I do so, um, I wanted to give the floor to a number of people. So I went out and interviewed a number of people, people that use Drupal in a big way and that are pushing the uh, limitations of the platform, really. And I've asked them to comment on these four things and uh, came back with a little video, which I'll show you now. We had tried a lot of the enterprise uh, content management systems out there. A lot of them were sort of legacy systems that were modified to work with the web. We narrowed our search down first open source, and then secondly, we looked at communities around the various open source platforms. And it didn't take us a long time until we came to Drupal and saw that it was a very vibrant, large community that was uh, very active in, in developing Drupal and pushing it into the future. Obviously, it's the community. I went to my first DrupalCon uh, in I think May of 2010 and was just blown away by the ecosystem and the, the energy. So having a very flexible, um, robust platform comes from having a vibrant community. The opportunity in the marketplace is huge. You know, I don't think that there has ever been uh, a time where the commercial products and the open source products were either so evenly matched or if anything, the open source products probably uh, have a richer feature set. We made the pitch that we're going to choose this new platform. We're going to deliver something on the web within one month, which for you know a big company, that's typically a very difficult thing to do. We had the, our first website was our exchanges platform, which is our, uh, our blog site out and in production within 30 days. Being able to hand, handle video well, uh, being able to hand, handle like text blog content well, uh, being able to handle you know community features well, um, and uh, in being able to combine those into a single cohesive site. Certainly some of the challenges with Drupal is talent starvation. How do we get more people involved into Drupal and how do we get them up to speed? I would like to see Drupal evolved to a place where mobile isn't something that's an afterthought. Works on any browser, uh, any screen size, any phone. There's a tremendous opportunity there to simplify workflow, to make things easier for editors uh, to perform everyday tasks. The opportunity for Drupal is enormous. Uh, you know, I, from where I'm sitting, I see a world where multi-million dollar CMSs are uh, going out of fashion. It really is an application platform and a platform to build web applications on top of. And I think Drupal's perception needs to break beyond that it's just this content management system. We'll start to do a lot more with mobile. 
Um, so I'm very excited about the opportunities to expand on our desktop uh, experiences and bring those to the mobile web uh, and we're going to be leveraging Drupal uh, to do that as well. I think that the vision is solid. I think that they want to take Drupal to a level where it continues to get easier and easier to deploy web content. As, as these companies are making this transition for the first time into this new, new ecosystem that they're getting very excited about, Drupal is going to be at the forefront of that decision-making process. I think the Drupal community represents what open source is all about. It's been great. Um, I feel a tremendous amount of promise. I love being part of the community and I'm incredibly appreciative for everything that everybody does every single day. What did you think? <laughs>So, a lot of what they, there's a lot of things here in what they said, and you know, I want to talk a little bit about these things um, in this keynote, but it's very consistent. Um, you know, these things are very consistent with things I hear everywhere. Like, wherever I travel, these are the kinds of things people are saying. So, let's break it out a little bit here. Um, let's talk about the strengths first. I think, um, you know, listening to the video, obviously, community, 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 you know, people everywhere look at Drupal and they see um, the biggest strength, you know, honestly being you guys. So that's a huge testament to all the work that you've done. Um, so. And, you know, obviously, what does that really mean, right? So if you, if you think a little bit about it, uh, the fact that Drupal is open source, the fact that we can share code, that the license allows us to share code, leads to collaboration. Right? And that kind of collaboration leads to community. And I think the important step is that community leads to innovation. And that's, I think, why so many people really like Drupal. Um, so they like Drupal for the community um, because that translates into a lot of flexibility. You know, tens of thousands of us are taking Drupal and extending it in different ways, you know, adding uh, tens of, you know, thousands of modules, really. Um, and that allows people to build pretty much any kind of website, right? It, it, it really changes the way people build websites. It, it frankly changes our industry, like where we're going from a world where people used to develop websites by writing code or by using frameworks to a world where people can actually assemble, for the most part, a website. So this vision of the assembled web um, and the kind of flexibility that that gives you is I think a direct effect of having a very vibrant and active community. Um, and it's a big change because it is replacing a lot of legacy uh, proprietary CMSs, so a uh, big opportunity there. So um, obviously we can talk about our strengths all day. <laughs> there, is, there is many, but uh, I would actually like to talk a little bit about um, our weaknesses and um, you know the things that keep me up at night. Um, well, let's see. So I really thought long about it, and I came back with three things. I, you know, obviously there is a few more, <laughs> but I think it really boils down to three big things. The first one is the fact that we have, you know, a rudimentary authoring experience, um, and I think there is two big things happening right now in the world. First of all, and this is relatively new, and it's it's kind of worrisome in a way for us. <laughs> um, is that the content authors, the actual staff that needs to use Drupal from you know, 9 a.m. in the morning till 5 p.m. at night or whatever, they're very involved nowadays in the you know, CMS selection process, if you will. Whereas it feels like even a year ago or two years ago, it was mostly a decision made, say, by IT or by technical people versus the actual people using the CMS. And that's kind of a, an interesting trend, which means we need to put a lot more emphasis on the authoring experience. And the second biggest trend, and this is one that I've talked about um, in the past, frankly, which is the uh, consumerization of IT. Like things like iPhones and you know, tablets and all of these things have fundamentally changed the way people expect applications to work and the kind of usability people expect from these applications. So I think these two things combined 
um, you know, really puts a lot more, uh, puts a bigger spotlight on Drupal's authoring experience. So I do want to talk a little bit about that in this keynote. Um, the second thing that keeps me up is um, our framework. Although Drupal still has, you know, is still, you know, in my opinion, one of the best CMSs technically, um, we're also at an interesting point. Like if you look back at the early days of Drupal, um, Drupal was successful because it was very accessible to hobbyists. People could get in the code, make some quick changes, and, um, you know, add to Drupal. I think for all the right reasons, Drupal has evolved to be more complex, and some of that accessibility is lost in the process. At the same time, for more seasoned developers, Drupal is also a little peculiar, like it isn't um, necessarily what they expect to be. So we've arrived at this point where um, it's a little hard for newbies or hobbyists, and it's also a little hard for uh, seasons, uh, seasoned developers. So something for us to work on. And I'll talk about that as well. The third um, thing that keeps me up is, um, you like this image? It's a pool with small people. <laughs> um, so it's a small Drupal talent pool. Um, but this is actually a good problem in a way because, you know, because Drupal is growing so fast, um, the demand for Drupal people, Drupal experts, continues to be bigger than the supply. And it's, it's one of those things which is holding us back a lot, actually. And uh, it's an area where we're doing a lot of work on. The Drupal Association made it one of its priorities to help grow the, the ecosystem. Um, there's things like Google Summer of Code, which we should all participate in or help with. So there's a lot of initiatives to try and, and overcome this. But um, it is important that we continue to work on this. So uh, these are some of the weaknesses. I'll come back to these in a second. So let's move on to opportunities. Um, so according to Mary Meeker, who is uh, a partner at Kleiner Perkins, I don't know how many people know Kleiner Perkins, but it's probably the number one or among the top venture capitalist firms in the world. Um, and so she said that we are now in the fifth major technology cycle. Um, what that means is, um, I'll, I'll let it come up on the screen, but it really means mobile. And so a lot of people are making very big bets on mobile. And so let's, let's put that in perspective a little bit. So if you look at Drupal today, um, we estimate there's about 1.5 million sites. So big applause for everyone. <laughs> Uh, that's a giant number, by the way. <laughs> um, but if you put it in perspective, um, it's only 6.7% uh, of all the websites that have a content management system. So it's a pretty large number, but it is our first opportunity. The opportunity is to go after the other um, you know, 90 plus percent. Um, and I think we're well on our way. I think that number keeps going up. Um, it's also where I think the platform, you know, vision comes in, like the, the one Drupal to rule them all vision, if you will, um, where we make Drupal better and more suitable for more, more different kinds of websites, right? So, um, so I think that number will go up over time. Interestingly, though, um, only about 30% of all the websites in the world actually do use a CMS. So how many people knew that? Not many. <laughs> so 70% um, of all the websites don't actually have a CMS. And that's also a huge opportunity for us because eventually either these websites will stop to exist or they'll probably move to a CMS. Right? So making Drupal easier and better will also help us go after that piece. Um, but the real opportunity, the biggest opportunity of all is really in mobile. You know, if we, if we are, if we believe the predictions, mobile is just about to explode and will be about 25, will grow by 25x um, over the next five years. And so in that picture, we're tiny, right? And we basically have kind of one shot at this with Drupal 8 to really go after mobile. So 
we are ready um, in five years. Um, so that, I think, is a big opportunity, and I'll come back to that as well in a second. So um, the threat really, in my opinion, is that we are unable to innovate um, and that we are basically being by, you know, bypassed by other systems. So I think we've talked about that in the beginning, the need for innovation and the way we innovate. So, um, all right, so that's kind of this section where we talked about the strengths, the community, the innovation, the weaknesses, um, the opportunity and the threats. So what does that mean, right? What do we do with this? Well, first of all, it means we need to start kicking ass with Drupal 8. Um, and so, you know, in the beginning of the presentation, I said, you know, I would like to win, I would like us to win the hearts and minds of, of more people. And so when I think about that, I would like us to focus for Drupal 8 on three different audiences. Um, hold on. Developers, uh, site visitors, and authors. And I'll talk about each of those um, in this presentation. So let's start with developers. So I've already explained some of the weaknesses, which is this aging uh, framework. So um, what we want to do there um, is really you know, update Drupal a little bit. I think, as I said, Drupal is still one of the best TMSs in the world. But I think also some of us realize that um, if we don't innovate on the framework piece, um, we risk um, being left behind. And so we spent you know, months and months discussing about what that means, um, you know, technically and architecturally. Um, and after months, we've decided to leverage, you know, pieces of Symfony, but we weren't all in agreement still. And so we basically, um, you know, got like 15 people in the room together, um, locked ourselves up in the room for about three days. And what we came out of is that actually we do want to use Symfony and we probably want to use more of it than we expected. So we've decided with Drupal 8 that we are going to embrace, um, you know, portions of Symfony it could be quite a bit. Uh, and obviously that's a very big deal. It's a very big dis decision for us because um, it will propagate to our contribute modules, the way we work, the things we need to learn and so forth. So, Instead of me talking about what that means, um, I've made another video, and I'll let two experts basically explain you what that means. Here we go. Drupal at this point is the most advanced and powerful traditional CMS on the market, but the market is changing and what is going to be a market leader in the next five to ten years is different than what was a market leader in the last five to ten years. Drupal right now has a huge opportunity to really reinvent and reposition itself to be the leading system of tomorrow as well. Symphony is uh Two different things. First and foremost, this is a set of reusable and cohesive uh, components um, that you can use for your PHP project. Symfony is also a full stack framework, um, and a full stack framework means that you have a tight integration between all the components and you don't need to make uh, the glue yourself. We are one of the first big framework to have. Um, embraced PHP 5.3 and all the namespaces and stuff like that. That's the first point. And the second one is that we have tried to make it uh, really flexible. Uh, I think the second version is really great if you want to create products on top of the framework itself. When we were working on uh, the WISC initiative, we had a number of goals. Easier support for web services and being able to build more robust uh, page layouts that could do partial page caching, could do edge site includes, could do aha callbacks in a much more efficient manner. And I think that's 
a going to be cultural shift for Drupal, but a positive one and one that we are ready for and will benefit from immensely, which means that enterprise developers uh, coming to Drupal will have an easier time adopting it. Developers coming out of computer science programs will have an easier time adopting it. It means that we can produce smaller pieces in modules that we can assemble Lego style in Drupal in a site and build a more tailored site with less work. People who want to use Drupal as both a content management system and a framework get a stronger underlying foundation for both. So, are we excited about this or not? <laughs> It's kind of a big deal. I mean, it's a very big deal. <laughs> um, so you know, expect to expect to you know see many of us talk about this at DrupalCon. Uh, Fabien, the uh, Symphony project lead, will is actually at DrupalCon, and there will be a session uh, this week on Symphony, and possibly other sessions as well. So if you're interested, make sure to uh, to attend these sessions. Um, you know, I couldn't explain it better than. Um, you know, than, than Larry and Fabien, but you know, obviously, Symphony brings us many benefits. Um, it's you know, for people that really don't really know Symphony, it's 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 a well-tested open-source project. It's very compatible. It has a very um, welcoming community behind it. We've we've had amazing help from these people in, in trying to do prototypes and stuff. Um, and it's you know, it's very solid technology. There's a lot of people using it. So I think. By um, leveraging Symphony, by working with the Symphony project, we'll be able to to go to more places faster. Um, especially on the technical side of things, there's a lot of interesting things in Symphony, which will allow us to build more pluggable websites. It's going to be easier to remove components from Drupal, but it also allows us to get to the next level of scalability. Because out of the box, for example, Symphony has embraced um, Edge site include, so it changes the way we can cache pages. It it changes the way we can render pages, and in doing so, we can go after bigger websites. Um, for me, one of the biggest advantages of Symfony is that it actually will help solve that you know small Drupal talent pool issue. I hope, I think, I believe, <laughs> um, because by adopting a modern framework, I think we'll be able to get um, more developers, more seen, you know, seasons seasoned developers, but also more junior developers and hobbyists, because ultimately people want to work with the tools of the future, right? They want to use, um, you know, for their own careers, they want to use the tools that will get them um, the, the furthest um, along. So um, that was kind of the first big thing, Symphony. Um, the second thing I wanted to talk about um, is what we need to do for uh, site visitors. And I've already talked a little bit about this um, today, but I've definitely talked about it in previous keynotes, is we need to build a great mobile experience. And it also came out of the video. But if you think back, if you look back, uh, in 2000, um, all the traffic came from desktop browsers. 10 years later, only in 2010, 3% of all the traffic came from mobile. Uh, if we are to believe these predictions, then by 2015, um, mobile traffic will be huge and you know, will be bigger than uh, desktop-based uh, traffic, if you will. And so about a year ago in my keynote in Chicago, I said, uh, if I were to rebuild Drupal from scratch today, I would build it for mobile first and browser, you know, desktop browser second. And so I really believe we need to you know, change Drupal, turn it around, if you will, so we can embrace mobile. Um, if you think about mobile, it actually, there's different kinds of mobile, if you will. There is native applications that run on your mobile devices, like iOS or Android. And then there is mobile web experiences, meaning people that visit your websites through a mobile browser on a mobile device. Right, and we need to do the right thing for both, because we need to do the right thing for native apps. Because um, I truly believe the web is changing from just web to web plus apps. 
right? I think that change is pretty visible to most of us, and as Drupal, we need to embrace that. Um, what that means, and what we're doing here, is on the native app side, we are uh, adding RESTful web services to Drupal core. We wanna make it very easy for people to retrieve content in Drupal in different formats. And we wanna be able to expose, you know, some of the CRUD functions, the basic, you know, operations on Drupal objects through APIs. I also think, and this is something we haven't talked much about, I also think that maybe we should start thinking about adding um, SDKs, software develop, developer kits, to Drupal and possibly maintain these as projects on DDO as well. So people have starting points to build mobile apps, right? Um, so hopefully something we can talk about this week. Um, and then on the mobile browser side of things, um, we are working on making HTML5 the default output of Drupal 8. And we're also working on adding things like responsive design and, and all of the things that you would come to expect um, there. So a lot of things going on there, um, a lot of progress being made. I think an area where we could do better is embracing a mobile culture. Like when we work together in issue queues, I almost never see anyone share a screenshot taken on their Android or taken on their iPhone, right? So we still need to get it in our DNA to, um, to really truly embrace mobile. And it's important that we do this now because we need to do it before the rest of the world does it. Uh, because we need to build Drupal <laughs> so that it's ready by the time the rest of the world wants it. <laughs> so I think we need to, to work on this a little bit more. Um, so maybe everybody should get an iPad or something. <laughs> if you reach under your chair. <laughs> it's, it's provided by the Drupal Association. <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> But maybe you can ask your boss. <laughs> um, but I think it would be really helpful for all of us to, um, to do this, right? So, all right. And we'll, we'll talk about this a lot at this conference as well. So the third audience is the, uh, the site visitors. Um, sorry, is the authors. Oh, um, let's see. All right, so we talked about site visitors. Let's talk a little bit about uh, authors. Um, this is a big one. Um, it's probably the, a newer one for most people. Um, but as I said, Drupal today really wins based on technical merits. And so did a whole bunch of research and I created this kind of like spider graph. <laughs> but it basically, what it shows you is different content management systems. Uh, and we've rated each of those based on technical strength. And so, I'm not sure it's very readable, but there's scores from zero to eight. If you have an eight like Drupal, it means you're the best. <laughs> um, and so you're, you're all the way out there, all right? And if you have a low score, technically, um, you're more towards the middle, all right? So Drupal is winning on technical uh, strengths, but if you look at the authoring experience, I think it looks a lot more like this, where, frankly, most of the other systems are better. Um, and so that's an area that we really, really need to work on. So if you look at the authoring experience in more detail, and you break it up in several components, you know, what does it actually mean, authoring experience, right? So it's like inline editing, workflows, mobile authoring, localization, layouts, all of these things. And if you look at all of these competitors that I just showed you, and you take the best from each of them in these areas, you can sort of create an ideal product, roughly. Right, and that's what's shown in orange. Um, and then we, we looked at Drupal and overlaid that with, uh, with the ideal product. And so what it shows you is that we're doing pretty well on the workflow, workflow site. And that's, you know, thanks to contributed modules like the workbench module and other things. 
But we're doing pretty weak, for example, on the inline editing side of things and, and some other areas. So ideally, over time, we would be able to sort of, you know, uh, span the entire graph and get a lot closer to what I think would be the ideal product. All right, so <clears throat> what does that actually mean? I think, I think it means a couple of different things. First of all, I think we should put more stuff in Drupal 8 core because a lot of these things are expected. A lot of these things are what I would call infrastructure that every person needs. It's like people want more inline editing. People want more drag and drop. People want more improved content administration tools. People really want better media uh, support. Like that's why people get a content management system <laughs> to be able to manage the content, right? And uh, people do want better page and layout building tools. And I think a lot of these things we should try and put in core, which would, you know, obviously make core bigger. At the same time, we need to keep core very pluggable because we also need to recognize that distributions are the best way to build you know, specialized user experiences. Like these things Core can do, Core can provide the infrastructure, but to really create the best user experience, you need to know the audience, and often distributions, they know the audience that they're built for. So um, we're also doing a lot on distributions. Uh, one big thing which we just did is we changed the way we can build distributions on D.O. We can now include external libraries and all of these things, uh, which is a big change. We're also working on better promoting distributions on D.O. Um, there's a lot of events happening to help grow a community around distributions. And ultimately, I think the big one is we, we really have to figure out the, um, the revenue model for distributions because I think um, do people can make money with building distributions or more money. Um, you can actually make money with distributions today, but if more money could be made, I think it would fuel, uh, it would cause more people to build really great distributions. And I think distributions are the way to, if you go back to the planets, it's, it's the way to capture more of the other things which we aren't doing yet. So um, here's a quick screenshot of some of the things which we're trying to do. Um, on the Drupal main page. As you can see on the screenshot, we're trying to make distributions first class citizens by adding it to you know, different pieces of the website. These are just mockups, but uh, gives you an idea of what is hopefully to come. And this is something uh, that just the, the Drupal Association wants to really start helping with. So we're starting to build a bigger team of people working on D.O. Um, all right, so obviously, kind of a big topic. <laughs> it's not necessarily easy um, to pull this off because it's really hard, especially as we get bigger, to build consensus on what is one considered good usability and secondly, what should belong in Drupal core and what shouldn't belong in Drupal core. I mean, this is the kind of stuff which we have talked about for many, many years. So. Here's a, here's a proposal on how to fix this. So first of all, let's look at the Drupal 8 timeline. This was announced recently, but I'll announce it again. Um, the goal is to get to feature freeze by December 1st. That's roughly eight months from today. Um, once we're feature frozen, there will be some time to uh, you know, complete the features which we started adding. And then ultimately, we wanna freeze the code by February 1st uh, 2013, with the goal to release Drupal 8 at the next um, DrupalCon in Europe. So not the one which is coming, but the one after that, right? Um, so that's, I think, roughly 18 months from today. So that gives you a sense of when you can start um, planning upgrades and things like that. So anyway, if we want to nail the authoring experience, um, in Drupal 8, and if we want to make progress there, we only have a little bit of time left. So what I would like to do here is, um, you know, go through three phases. First of all, I think we should do some analysis. You know, we should do more talking, brainstorming about what we want to add to core. I don't have all the answers. I think it very much 
should be a collaborative effort to figure out what we want to do. Then I think we should come up with designs, mock-ups, maybe even prototypes. And then by the end of July, I should really start to make some decisions based on these mock-ups. Like we're gonna add this to core, and this is what it's gonna look like. So we can actually start implementing it. And basically implement the mock-ups that we kind of signed off on. Um, once implemented, hopefully these things will be able to get committed uh, before feature freeze. What exactly will go in, I don't know yet. Um, we have a lot of work to do here, but I think it's important that we have some sort of timeline and that we have decision-making points in order to get there. So that's what I would like to do, and I'm sure we'll talk more about that uh, this week as well. Uh, other than that, we're also working on a lot of other things. Um, I don't necessarily want to rehash all of them, but uh, we've launched a number of, of you know, initiatives for Drupal 8, and this graph, this graph actually tries to summarize some of our status. So what it really means is that most of the initiatives, they're, you know, they're pretty much done with their analysis, meaning we have figured out what we want to build. It's kind of the what. Um, most of them are doing really well on the design phase, meaning we know how to build it, right? And all of them are in the development phase. Like, we know what to build, how to build it, now we just have to build it. Uh, it's a lot of work, um, so that's why it's important that more people actually get involved. We need a lot more help. Um, if we wanna get this done, we're gonna have more people um, you know, that need to contribute to making this possible. So make sure to go to the sessions. Each of these initiatives will have sessions, either in the core conversations or elsewhere, where you can learn how to get involved and where you can learn about the details. So, <clears throat> so I think if we do these three things, if we focus on these three things, I think we can win the hearts and minds um, of authors, developers, and site visitors. I think that would fuel uh, into a lot more passion. Uh, I think it would make Drupal better. I actually think it would help us overcome um, our weaknesses. Um, we would do more of our strengths. It would overcome the weaknesses because we would go after, you know, we would fix the framework thing with Symfony. Um, we would fix the authoring experience with some of the work we're doing. And I actually think in doing these two things, we actually also help fix a talent pool issue, as we talked about. At the same time, by doing mobile, we actually go after the opportunity, which is also very important. And again, in doing so, we reduce the threat of being, um, you know, of being replaced by something else. Uh, and if we do so, I think we can make Drupal 8 very successful, and I think it can translate in the next big bump um, in terms of adoptions. And with that, I'd like to say thank you and thank you, and uh, open the uh, floor for some Q&A. I think we have about 10 minutes or so. Yeah, um, it didn't take very long before DrupalCon keynote was a trending hashtag in the US. Oh, oh. I think three to five minutes and it was announced that it was pretty much out of control. So I think we got uh, some good questions uh, ready to go and I guess we'll start with some difficult ones and then move to Excellent. the easy ones. <laughs> so first one we have is from a, a gentleman named Art USA Mac. Uh, what is the limit of Symfony integration and does it mean rewriting Drupal on Symfony? Right, it's a good question. Um, I don't have the answer. <laughs> um, so, you know, we've basically agreed to use certain components of Symfony. Um, at the same time, as you saw on the, on the, on the graph with the progress bar, um, Larry and the rest of the team, they're still trying to figure out how far we wanna go. So we have some things which we agreed upon, and then there's basically still some, some gray area where we, where we wanna you know, figure it out still. So um, it's the best I can say right now. Sure. So, but go to Larry's session. He may have all the, the wisdom. Or at least it has some good answers for oh, us. Yes. So we have another uh, question from a designs drive. Uh, will Drupal 8 be mobile friendly out of the box? Yes, so the goal, 
that would definitely be the goal. Um, so one of the things which we're doing is, as I, as I explained, we want to output HTML5 out of the box. And then also we want to update all of our themes that ship with Core to, to support responsive design. Excellent. We want to improve the admin backend so that it actually works great on mobile devices. So we're doing all of these different things through a number of these initiatives with the goal to, to, make a, to provide a great out-of-the-box experience on mobile devices. So awesome. That's great okay. news. This is from... Are uh, these a difficult questions, by the way? The, 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 <laughs> we threw in an easy one there. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll, and you asked for it. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This one's from Mr. Randy Fay. Are there oh. changes we need to make in our community or development process now that we have grown so large? All right, that's a tough one. Thanks, Randy. <laughs> um, I think the answer may be yes. Um, I think... And I think we, I think we have a culture of making changes. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, if you compare the way we work on Drupal 8 versus Drupal 7, I think that's already a huge change. Sure. Um, we put a lot more process in place in terms of, you know, number of critical bugs which we want to have open, but also the initiatives and uh, putting people, the initiative leads in, a, in more of a spotlight. Mm -hmm. um, I think is a way to to delegate leadership and authority, and I think as we get bigger, and as core gets bigger, I think we need to, to do so. Um, I have a few other ideas in that area as well, um, which I'll talk about in my core conversation. Um, but I don't know when it is, but this week. Sure. So, so, but the answer is yes, and I think, I think we've always been open to kind of, you know, discussing these, and I think we have a, a track record of implementing changes as well. 